Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and last time I covered Hill during the first day at Gettysburg. This video picks up with Day 2, July 2nd, and continues on to July 3rd and the retreat from Gettysburg. It was Thursday, July 2nd, at around 6 a.m. when Hill ordered Anderson's division to replace Heath's division at the front. Powell then went to Lee's headquarters, where Longstreet soon arrived. Lee sat on a fallen tree and placed a map on his lap. Hill and Longstreet stood and looked over the map with the army commander. Lee explained that Longstreet would attack the Union right, and when the fighting got to Hill's sector, then Hill's corps would engage the enemy. Hill's front line acted as the center of the Confederate line, with Pender's division constituting Hill's left and Anderson on the right. Heath's division, now under Pettigrew, remained in reserve. The morning hours passed away as Hill waited for Longstreet to attack. Images of the Seven Days Battles must have run through his head as he waited for someone else to attack. Lee and his staff joined Hill in waiting for the attack. Hill asked for some water from his aide, who returned with a bucket of dirty water. The aide apologized but informed the general that no good water could be found within a mile. The aide asked if Hill would want to wait for better water. Hill declined and drank for a long time from the bucket. Most of the time, the two generals sat on tree stumps or under shade trees in silence, waiting for Longstreet's men to launch their assault. As they waited, Jeb Stuart rode into view in the afternoon. Stuart and Lee exchanged a few words, then Stuart rode off. At around four, artillery blasts and musketry could be heard to the south, meaning that Longstreet was on the move. Hill informed his artillery officer to open up with his 55 cannons and aid General Longstreet's attack. As the battle intensified, Hill climbed a tree to get a better view of the attack. When the battle came to Anderson's front, he was expected to join in the attack. Of course, Hill thought Anderson would be acting under the orders of Longstreet, and Longstreet thought that Hill would command the support. So Anderson acted independent of both commanders, forming on Barksdale's left, Wilcox's Alabamians, Lang's Floridians, and Wright's Georgians pushed to Cemetery Ridge. The Union forces counterattacked and drove the Confederates away from the hard-won ground. By nightfall, Hill's men rested where they stepped off a few hours before. Hill received word about this time that his close friend and division commander Dorsey Pender was horribly wounded by an artillery shell while organizing his troops. One of Hill's biographers stated of the second day at Gettysburg, Left to his own devices in his first battle under Hill, Anderson was indecisive and sloppy in his actions. Even one of his privates saw the division's advance lacked concert of movement and resulted in a large sacrifice of life. Anderson did not even send in all of his brigades, as Hill desired. Mahone's Virginians never saw action, for reasons still not clear. Hill's leadership on July 2nd also left something to be desired. Maybe it was the fact that one division in his corps with which he was totally unfamiliar in combat was making the attack. Perhaps in spite of the surface cordiality between Hill and Longstreet, mutual resentment still smoldered so that neither made any attempt to clarify the responsibility of Anderson's division. In addition, Hill could have ordered Heath's division or Pender's to enter the action. Possibly Hill, remembering the carnage of the previous day when he had attacked without specific instructions, decided to do nothing without directives from Lee. That night, Hill rode again to Lee's headquarters. This time, he was met with multiple officers of Stuart's command, and he greeted and shook their hands. As he talked with them, Lee heard Hill's voice and came out to greet him. Lee took Hill by the hand and said in a fatherly manner, It is all well, General. Everything is well. Lee met with Longstreet and Hill to discuss the next day's fight. The Confederates would target the Union Center, using three divisions, one from Longstreet's Corps under George Pickett and two from Hill's Corps, Heath's Division, now under Pettigrew, and Pender's Division, that would be commanded by Major General Isaac Trimble, who was without command. Longstreet would assert control over these three divisions and use them in the assault of the Union Center. In the late morning of July 3rd, Lee conferred with Longstreet and Hill. Hill was enthusiastic about the assault and suggested for the entire Third Corps to take part. Lee told him he needed the rest of the Corps to hold their position and be in reserve if Longstreet's assault failed. After conferring with Lee, Longstreet and Hill met a short distance away on a fallen tree and hashed out the details in a lengthy discussion. The two men parted without even shaking hands and didn't communicate with one another the rest of the day. Hill rode off to his brigade and division commanders and informed them to take orders from Longstreet. Hill assumed that Longstreet would take command of his divisions, and Longstreet assumed 
that Hill would possess some degree of control over his own men during the attack, so neither man really took charge of Hill's divisions. Around one o'clock, an artillery bombardment let loose from the Confederate side and it quickly turned into a duel. At around 3 p.m., the Confederate line emerged from the tree line on Seminary Ridge. The two wings, because of the confusion in command, started off separately with Pettigrew's division in the lead and Trimble in support. Pickett's division was on the right. As they advanced across the field, three horses fell under Pettigrew from the intense musketry. A piece of shrapnel wounded Pettigrew in the hand while he led his men forward on foot. Trimble received a serious leg wound that required amputation. All but one of the brigade commanders in Pettigrew's division became casualties in one form or another. The Confederate left faltered and gave way, producing a domino effect. Hill watched as the Confederate troops streamed back to Seminary Ridge. The Third Corps, in its first campaign, lost 7,671 men, 1,554 killed, 4,362 wounded, and 1,755 missing. As one of his biographers stated, promotion to Corps command had in essence separated him from the ranks. He had to watch while others participated. It was not a natural role for Hill. He never handled it well, and it brought him more frustration than fulfillment. After sundown, Lee visited Ewell and Longstreet, then made his final stop at Hill's headquarters. They sat on camp stools and with the light of a single candle studied a map. Hill would take the lead of the retreat back to Virginia if Meade did not attack the next day. Lee traced the route to be used with his finger. At one in the morning the meeting ended and Lee rode off. Hill attempted to get a few hours of sleep. At dark on July 4th, Hill's men began to file onto the road preparing for a retreat. Hill was instructed to pass through the mountains above Fairfield and set up defenses. Once the other two corps got to that location, then the corps of Ewell and Hill would alternate as the lead column. A hard rain set in which made the retreat more miserable for the defeated army. A soldier remembered, at length the loud laughter of the men comprising the head of A.P. Hill's column advancing banished every indication of sleep. They fought hard and were now fallen back and wading to their knees in mud and mire. They were as cheerful a body of men as I ever saw, and to hear them, you would think they were going to a party of pleasure instead of retreating from a hard-fought battle. At Hagerstown, Hill waited for engineers to build a pontoon bridge at Fallen Waters. Ewell and Longstreet's corps passed by, then Hill's men brought up the rear. Most of the army crossed the Potomac River, leaving the divisions of Heath and Pettigrew on the other side. The two divisions were about a mile and a half from the crossing when Hill ordered Heath to form his men into battle line perpendicular to the road and for Pettigrew to move to the pontoons. Assuming that Confederate cavalry screened his front, Heath did not send out skirmishers. So when cavalry appeared in his front, Heath assumed they were Stuart's cavalry providing a screen for the army. Heath's miscalculation and mismanagement resulted in a blow to the Confederacy. Just as the Confederate officers recognized the horsemen as Federals, the cavalry started galloping and charged into their midst. Before the altercation, Heath allowed his men to stack arms and rest, so when the Federal cavalry entered their lines, the rebel infantry grabbed what they could to defend themselves. One man wielded an axe while another used a split rail to fight back against the horsemen. During the melee, Pettigrew attempted to mount his horse with his badly wounded hand, but the horse threw him. The North Carolinian jumped up and reached into his jacket to grab a pistol and then ran toward a Federal trooper. Before he pulled the trigger, the blue-clad soldier shot Pettigrew in the stomach. Pettigrew slumped over. One of the general soldiers used a rock to kill the horseman, but the damage had already been done. After that brief skirmish where 39 Federals and two Confederates died, Hill crossed the river with the rest of the Corps. They were now in Virginia.